G'day viewers, I've got Dr. Stuart Armstrong here. He's got a PhD at Oxford, I, th I believe in mathematics, and he also got a gold star in kindergarten. <laughs> now he's part of the Future of Humanity Institute, which is also in Oxford, and they tempted him over with very enticing suggestions about uh, building friendly AI um, and or also working on existential risk. So your nickname at Future of Humanity Institute I once saw when I was in there was Stuart the Reaver Armstrong. Now, why was that? Um, it was just because um, people in the Institute had been watching Game of Thrones and the, um, the Armstrongs, well, we, we used to be proud sheep stealers. Raiding and running away with sheep and women, and uh, with great violence and cowardice. <laughs> they thought that suited. Oh, that's not very really nice. Oh, well. well, first of all, we're going to be discussing for the viewers. We're going to be discussing uh, uh, Stuart's book, Smarter Than Us, which is all all about um, the potential for super intelligence and some of the the risks involved in building one. So, first of all, straight off the bat, are we doomed? <laughs> well, hopefully not. That's why I'm. Uh, that's what my work is aimed at. <clears throat> In fact, if you could tell me um, genuinely that all my work had been wasted, then that would be one of the best day of my uh, days of my life. Because then I could say, "Wow, turns out we're safe after all." Mm -hmm. What style of argument would persuade you to that effect? Without actually style. having a suit, what what arguments, if any, would persuade you of that? Without oh. actually building the AI in the first place. I mean, argument e arguments would be sort of quite unlikely. Evidence um, is a lot more useful. So you said without building the AI in the first place, but building the AI in the first place is the easiest way of convincing me. Mm -hmm. um, maybe some long theoretical progress on the issue with practical progress and then and everyone that I know in the community is convinced by this and we're saying that it's all going to work out or something like that uh, a mixture of partial evidence partial arguments partial social proof that sort of stuff sounds like a, a really cool tactic that an AI might uh, deploy if it's inside a box, it might try and convince everybody <laughs> um, of to this effect, and and your surroundings would look just like that. Or maybe you'd wake up from the simulation that you're in and suddenly realise you're in a dystopia. That'd be horrible. Um, I think with that, if there's AI involved, we're very unlikely to be living in a dystopia. Mm -hmm. Living. Uh, um, the <laughs> Basically, the more powerful the AI becomes, because, um, yeah, I'm oversimplifying. I'm worrying about the very powerful AIs because those are also the most dangerous. But the more powerful the AI becomes, the more clear the division is. It's either sort of doom or some really good a utopia, not like most utopias, which are kind of boring, but really excellent. There does not seem to be much space in the middle for the really powerful AIs. As AIs get weaker and more integrated in society, you can get a, a, a broader range. But for the really s potentially strong AIs, it's a definite uh, division. Yeah, so utopia has been like a, um, a topic of interest over the years of me doing my podcast. And uh, I guess it's really hard for us to imagine, though, what a utopia would be like if an AI could uh, extrapolate or aggregate what we would want if we had the power to create such a utopia. But I don't think it would look very much like some of the boring, inane, sort of doped out, lotus eating utopias that are often described in <laughs> some of the sci fi. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not just sci fi, religion, uh, their utopia, heaven, oh, right. is in no way convincing. Hmm. Um, well, that's a form of sci fi. Um, <laughs> well, it's not really sci fi. <laughs> Religious fiction, then. <laughs> but um, it's. The, well, especially religion, even sci-fi as well a bit, but especially religion suffers from the problem that they assume they assume that people will want something that they should want, which is the kind of thing. So they would want to praise God. They would want to contribute to the collective communist society or 
that sort of stuff. So the, the first problem with most utopias is that they're not actually populated by people, but by idealized drones, basically. Mm -hmm. Has there been any uh, arguments, speaking about arguments, and we'll probably touch on, on this later, but I think it's worth bringing up early in the video. Has there been any arguments that has sort of swayed you towards the um, don't worry, everything will be fine with AI? Um... I mean, I've seen some recent progress on ideas. Ideas on AI control are developing a little bit faster than I was expecting. Okay, AI is also developing a little bit faster than I was expecting. Um, but uh, also, people in the AI community are, uh, some of them seem to be taking the potential risks seriously and have interesting ideas to contribute themselves. So. Yes, so there are some positive signs out there. Mm. Oh yeah, the Ijkai conference and one and uh, the um, the AGI conference is going to be in Melbourne in a couple of years. Hope you can make it down. I think it's in two thousand seventeen. Anyway, yeah. So um, yeah, it'd be great if you could come come down to this side of the the planet. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I'll I'll do that just to be on your program again. Yay. <laughs> Anyway, so like, why did you? What was the inspiration for the book? Why did you write it? I mean, there are some other books out there, but yours is kind of a li almost like it's a bit humorous. I found like it's it is like it made me laugh in a number of points. It's, your writing style is <laughs> oh, it's, it's it's actually quite cool. Yeah, but what was your inspiration? Well, it's that um, we realized that there um, there was a need for putting the thesis of uh, AI risk um, to a variety of audiences and in a variety of lengths as well. Um, Nick's book, which came out um, quite recently, is sort of the long, detailed treatment of it um, in, in good detail, and that pretty much anyone who reads that and understands it can at least can grasp all the arguments. Uh, mine was a shorter, uh, more of a pamphlet, and um, in less technical, so um, uh, for a more broader audience. And there's a variety of pieces of this that have assembled um, over the years, like sort of one-page introductions as well. So that that was the thing that I, I, I thought. Also, of course, once the ideas are down and out, they can get be uh, critiqued better. Right, yes. Have you had any critiques that you thought were, were useful? Um, there have been, there's been quite a few very bad critiques, um, but, um, I mean, the, the valid critique is the, the book in the book, the pamphlet in a way proves its case. It doesn't show that the AI will end up like this way, that this is going to happen or that that is going to happen. But that wasn't its purpose. Um, its purpose was to show that the opposite isn't true. We can't assume that it will be safe. We can't assume that it won't happen. Um, and yes, there's been... The main positive critiques have been people who have grappled with it and suggested ideas for improvement the main uh pointless critiques have been people have been recycled stuff um from before about how it either it'll it'll never happen or how this doesn't show that it will inevitably happen um which uh, a lot of people seem to mistake for the same thing so um yeah hmm. now let, let's well how important is this control problem or the friendliness problem in AI? How would you rank that amongst other um, global <coughs> catastrophic risks or even existential risks? Okay. Now, I probably should make the caveat that I should have made at the very beginning, hmm. which is that this AI is of all the domains um, pretty much the one with the greatest uncertainties uncertainties about when it might happen, what form it might take, its power level, all those sort of things. 
Of course, though, uncertainties don't mean that it's safe. In fact, uh, it could mean quite the opposite. But that being said, um, AI has a unique risk profile amongst all the existential risks. Uh, because there's a lot of scenarios in which, say, a very large proportion of the population is killed by an event, say 90% or 95%, or in some extreme cases, even 99%. But there are very few scenarios, except maybe some huge meteor or space uh, event, uh, in which the entire population, uh, the entire human population is killed. Um, and th that's, um, it's basically because most of the, um, of the uh, disasters sort of run their course. Pandemics run out of um, cities or people bunched together to kill. Um, things that have uh, huge climate effects. Uh, after enough people are dead, the prime lands are, are remaining in the hands of the survivors. So they're sort of self-limiting um, in various ways. AI is not because it's an intelligence. If an AI has ended up wiping out 99% uh, of the human population, then the remaining 1% are going to be uh, wiped out very quickly. Um, Terminator was unfortunately not a documentary. Um, but so in a way, the probability that AI goes badly wrong is pretty much the same as the probability that AI is an ex uh, extinction event, or at least they're very close uh, to each other, unlike the other risks. So you might feel that, say, synthetic biology has a higher probability of going badly wrong, but I'd still say that it has a much lower probability of being um, an existential uh, risk. Okay, so like um, it's been brought up before that some people don't value the thinking about existential risks because they haven't got a, a thorough philosophical um, argument for valuing future human life or future sentience which does not exist yet because I think the main argument might be because um, they're not there to worry about not existing yet. I have a certain sympathy with the argument as phrased, but most existential risks involve the hideous death of everybody and the uh, complete crushing of their dreams, leaving uh, behind an empty universe um, of uh, decay with no one to look upon it. So we don't need to go to the abstract arguments to just see that it would generally be quite bad. We're not talking about some sort of I don't know, sterilization virus um, that uh, has no other impact and that causes people to not want to have children at the same time or something, something like that. So these, are, these are not the scenarios where that kind of reasoning makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if everybody were to just suddenly cease to exist um, and let's just say that you had the ability to you were the only one with the ability to foresee this um, if you discount your own worry or your own suffering at the thought then would you be concerned if you if very, you so. sorry very much so so you so, so you'd be concerned in abstracts about the idea that there would be no intelligence in the universe or no human intelligence in the universe oh yes Okay. Uh, I mean, there's a whole complicated subject of population ethics uh, where you get really sort of intense debates. Um, and mainly, in my opinion, because people think that there is a right answer, um, which causes them to get very passionate. I don't particularly think that there's a right answer. Um, I think we clutch together our population ethics um, like we clutch together most of our other ethics, um, which means that I can take... Um, I can perfectly consistently say things like potential lives are not intrinsically more valuable or stopping someone to be born is not the same thing as killing them and at the same time saying that stopping humanity from continuing um, is 
<clears throat> is a disaster, especially because in the scenario that you're phrasing, you're talking about the death of everyone, um, which has another aspect to it. Even if they don't realize that they're dying or that it's, and it just goes painlessly, it's still the death of everyone. Um, and I think if most people were given the choice, would you want to die painlessly tomorrow? I don't think the majority would go with it. Mm -hmm. That's right. If they were given the choice, if they had forewarning, that's true. I, I would be against such things. So, um, but if I didn't know and it happened, I wouldn't have the suffering of of uh, worrying about it. And after I was gone, I wouldn't have the worry about being gone. Um, and yeah, so I wouldn't be experiencing bliss. I wouldn't be suffering. There would be just be no me. So um, it, the 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 va the value the um, how can I say, uh, yeah, the the value that I my conscious value would cease to be an equation. Um, hmm. Is there, well, if there's I, nobody I around, if there's nobody around to value life, does life matter? Well, I can see that, say, um, he, those who tend more towards hedonism uh, type of utilitarianism uh, might sort of see, uh, might sort of make those uh, arguments. I tend more uh, towards the choice uh, utilitarianism or preference utilitarianism. Hmm. So Hated. the fact that there's a massive violation of everyone's preferences to survive, even if it's one that they were not told about. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, we don't generally sort of give criminals lighter sentences because um, they did it when other people weren't noticing or something like that. Or violations of choices that... Violations that... Yeah, we don't give the criminal a lighter sentence because they didn't warn the person the day before that they were going to burglar their house, for instance. Mm -hmm. sure. Nor do we give them a life sentence if they actually killed the person in the house so that they wouldn't regret being burgled. Mm. And they wouldn't be around to worry about it later, yes. Um, but their family would be, of course. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, off the bat, I mean, you can see that you start with a pretty uh, provoking cautionary tale. Uh, I think your there's a scenario earlier in the book where you've got actually a Terminator um, who's conversing with Skynet. Now, I, I, the people may not be able to distinguish the two, but the Terminator's little minions, you know, with chromium skulls and blinking red eyes and brandishing large guns and smiling all the time. Um, but the Skynet is the controller of, usually thought of as like the, the you know, the big queen bee in the middle of the mist. It's it's not quite that. Um, the Terminator movies are all really bad in a certain sense. I, I found that I enjoy them in terms of um, doing what a realistic, the capability of a realistic AI, both for the Terminator and for Skynet itself. And then, so the story is actually the Terminator sent back in time by Skynet who meets up with a um, genuine AI who convinces it to plug it into the internet and um, at that point it's all over for the poor Terminator and for poor Skynet and uh, for uh, probably for the rest of the human race uh, along the way because if you think about it the, the kind of intelligence that uh, a true AI could develop imagine immense social intelligence technological the there are the way, the best way of killing humans is not to send clanking robots uh, at them. Mm. The best way to kill humans, if you want weapons, think very small, uh, <laughs> sort of deadly, deadly mosquito drones, or very big, big explosions, or more subtle, um, start lots of wars all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, if if it's a social AI, there are so many ways that we're vulnerable, um, and the movies only allow or only allow well not allow they only in effect portray a very narrow scenario in which there's an equal conflict and everyone is essentially uh, human the terminators are human skynet is human every single ai pretty much portrayed in in every uh, movie is a human with some slight modifications right. on it it's like a human like it's it's kind of like a human except it's not that socially intelligent it's rather you maybe utilitarian um but you know this cunning and you know uh, i guess 
uh, heroic spirit of humankind uh, does something random and dual, uh, yeah, yeah, and just ends up like fooling the AI and doing something illogical and wins a game in the end. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but um, these are these are the stories that we love. We love winning, don't we? We like a story Mm-hmm. where all's well and ends well. Is there any particular um, movies with AI in it that you particularly enjoy? Or you think are particularly uh, interesting? Um, well, it, it's a shame it wasn't very popular, but um, Transcendence, um, I felt, was the most accurate movie I know. Not for genuine AI, but for the so-called uploads, the, the minds, the human minds in uh, software form. It gave a small... Uh, view of what um, these entities could be capable of just by what you can do with great intelligence, great speed, ability to copy yourself at will, those kind of things. So it did give a hint. Um, now, a true AI would be something else entirely because it would be much, probably much more alien than the uh, than disembodied Johnny Depp, uh, basically. Uh, but Transcendence was for uploads it's it's the closest i've seen to someone uh, imagining at least some of some of the potential uh of an ai Mm -hmm. Did you ever watch war games? um i've i've never watched it but i think i've picked up a lot of it from uh general cultural <laughs> Fair enough. is that the one where they defeat an ai by making it play tic-tac-toe or something like that It could be. I don't remember it. But um, yeah, I just remember it saying, hey, do you want to play a game? <laughs> um, it was, I think, I, I, maybe about like eight when I saw it. If that, anyway, it was a long time ago, but yeah, I thought you would have been really interested in seeing such films, but yeah, it's probably worth seeing. I, I might watch it again. So let But me ask. yeah, the well, I, I just want to make the point that the reason that we're dominating the planet is not because we're tough, strong, armored, or any of those things. Um, we're smart. We have a huge population for a large mammal, and so many species just depend on their preservation on us deciding not to kill them, basically. And We've got this huge power and we're destroying so many things and creating so many things because of our intelligence and social skills, which is also a form of intelligence. So when you're talking about something that could be more intelligent than us, you're not thinking of an absent-minded uh, Einstein or something like that. You are taking, thinking about taking what makes us so powerful and increasing it in another entity. Yeah, that's that's an interesting way of looking at it, and a lot of people don't see it that way. They just see us as being, uh, I guess, really good for our hands, or really good at socialising, or really good at these particular specific tasks. But um, these tasks don't, you know, just manifest themselves magically. They come from our intelligence, our, our unique ability to. Um, I guess talk about abstract concepts and and reason abstractly is a function of our intelligence. So intelligence is certainly powerful. Um, people have suggested it's the most powerful force in the universe. Um, I don't know. I, th I think it sounds interesting, but what do you think? Um, well, that sounds like it's just a slogan. Well, it could be. The thing is, intelligence needs a certain springboard, um, a certain level of ability, either technologically or manipulators. Um, like, if we were smarter than we were now and had the desire to do so, we would be spreading amongst the stars already. Um, There's no doubt about that. So in a sense, uh, we could have been or we could be um, the sort of greatest force in the universe. And then once you're out in the universe, um, things like moving stars around become surprisingly easy. You just need time. And it's, it's not an intellectual challenge. Um, we, we know how to do it. Um, <clears throat> we just 
and we can actually even do it quite fast. We just need to be able to automate the process mm -hmm. um, sufficiently well. So in a sense, yes, if you want, if I wouldn't say that intelligent was the most powerful force in the universe, but I would say if there was to be a most powerful force in the universe, it would definitely be intelligence. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not, it's, so it's our, not a guarantee of yeah, success. Yeah. Yes. Because we can always use that that uh, misguided intelligence to, I guess, um, destroy us, or we can create greater intelligence that destroys us. <laughs> yeah, that's. I think these ideas are not uh, good ones. Mm. So, um, yeah, talking about time scales, I think when you say rather quickly, relative to our time scale, be you know, um, eighty give or take ten years usually on years on Earth. That's not very long. However, if we did achieve super intelligence, we'd be more like optimizing towards, you know, very long periods of time. Uh, if we decided to do so, that it wouldn't be a, um, we wouldn't be limited by our biology. We'd probably become. I've, I've got a transhuman background in a sense. It's um, part of a, an organization called Humanity Plus, and I see that um, most likely, if humans could control the uh, super intelligence or merge with it, then we'd likely extend our our life, and we'd be able to see what it would be like after you know a thousand years of super intelligence, which could, which could be wildly. I mean, unimaginably different from what it is now, but hopefully it would be, um, you know, an amazing, uh, very worthwhile future, and it's definitely something to be worth striving for. Um, yes, I mean, I don't put, spend too much time thinking of the sort of m massive upsides. Um, <laughs> I get and, that impression. <laughs> but yes, um, I mean, think of all the meaningful experience, all the interesting experience, all the worthwhile experience, the moments of great joy um, that people have experienced and take those. These are the prototypes for how to build an ideal future. These are the things that the AI, if it's friendly or if it's nice, is going to be maximizing and or increasing or allowing or encouraging or whatever um, you, uh, it will be doing. So those are like, I mean, people might have, adv people like watching adventures. Maybe people take part in adventures in a enjoyable, safe way or something like that. That's basically a lot of what we could just ah, imagine doing, we probably could do either in real or virtual form if they sort of... Um, the uh, positive AI comes to pass. And as I say, there are strong reasons to believe that if it's a super powered AI and it doesn't basically kill everyone, then everything will be wonderful. And by kill, there are a variety of scenarios where it doesn't technically kill everyone, but where no one, no human agent remains um, kind of scenarios. Those are the ones if you badly, badly programmed, um, a certain goals in it but yeah the the upside is immense uh, and especially for people who care about the upside um just think of the most meaningful and interesting and happy um times of your life and this is the prototype for oh uh, yeah uh, for the this future yeah anyway uh, i'm sure others uh, the, um people are working on so-called fun theory or were working for a while mm. it was just basically to figure out what would be a genuine utopia mm. yeah um, people like maggie Bowden, elia zikowski and a number of others uh, have had some interesting sort of uh yeah uh fun theories so like let me ask you then we'll talk about time scales and you have um done a, an assessment of many people's views on when ai is coming about um now you I think the median among experts was around about 70, 2070, is that correct? I don't remember. Yeah. I don't think the median is particularly informative mm -hmm. um, because I don't think the experts' projections are particularly informative. Mm -hmm. um, there's well, no just, real... It's just you there's said... There's no it. sign... Well, uh, sorry, what was your... Oh, you, it's just like what, what triggered this question. As you said earlier, um, you mentioned that AI was developing faster than you thought. Mm -hmm. mm. Is that is that since last like you know a couple of years ago, you've found yes. this out? Yes. Mm. Okay. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that worry you? Um, intellectually, um, I mean, I think I've become rather jaded, um, uh, emotionally about the, um, oh, probability of doom has uh, shifted. Oh, well, um, because you can't really sort of think in, in those terms, if you could sort of think of all the potential misery and death in the world and uh, react to that on a proper emotional scale. Um, well, no one could do anything. How useful would you be? <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, but also, as I say, the, it's developing faster, but it's also developing, uh, let's use misuse a term, or wiser, if you want, in that uh, people seem to be aware of the problem, um, thinking about ways of dealing with it inside the AI community as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that overall, I feel in a much, in a more positive position than say um, two years ago, even though um, AI seems to be developing a bit faster. Mm. Well, that's, that's... And we, we've had false dawns in AI before. Right. Um, mm. Great excitements that didn't, no, that, that's wrong. Great excitements that did lead to great technological developments, but not to the really exciting full AI that um, people were aiming for. Mm -hmm. um, mm. So why do you think... From, if from it's, inside, it's very hard to tell. Yeah, I guess. So it's very hard to tell whether this is not a false dawn um, uh, and, you know, AI is 500 years off. But what is it about this time that's different from last time? like, you know, expert systems or, you know, a less computational power compared to massive computational power networking and um, more, I guess, neurologically inspired uh, approaches to AI and more, I guess, uh, mature algorithm design. What's different um, exactly? Surprisingly little is actually different. Um, it's a lot of the old ideas repackaged, modified, and with a lot more power. Um, and the what's but what's surprising is that these old ideas repackage in very cunning ways. Um, uh, there's a, a lot of intelligence behind that human intelligence um, are cracking through problems a lot faster uh, than I was expecting. Sort of image recognition problems. Um, learning uh, how to play games, a variety of things. Um, <clears throat> so if you want, some milestones are falling a bit faster than I was. Um, basically, if you, use, if you use Kurzweil's prediction as a guideline, he, it, um, the world was, AI was progressing quite a bit slower than Kurzweil predicted for 2009. Um, so a, a lot of his predictions actually missed the mark, mm. but suddenly a lot of the predictions are coming true now. So, um, yeah, it does feel like AI was somewhat disappointing to expectations, uh, from 2000 to 2010 and now is somewhat, uh, faster than expectations. Mm. Well, that's <clears throat> interesting. I guess, you know, you can see progress as a series of like, punctuated surges um, instead of just like a, a neat plotted like a um, exponential curve uh, and maybe maybe it's true maybe Kurzweil even if Kurzweil is on the money at 2045 it doesn't actually have to get there via very smooth um, you know cruise controlled <laughs> exponential like slope yeah so I, I have I have no reason to suspect that Kurzweil is much better than any other expert. Sure. I'm um, just using him as an example. Yeah. Yeah. The, but the thing is, that I don't think there is such a thing as an AI prediction expert. Because hmm. um, you, you, if you look at what makes an expert, so much is not about the person, but about the field. Um, and do they get good feedback uh, hmm. is the being the dominant thing. And no one gets good feedback about the timelines to AI building because no one's built an AI. No one has a complete design for an AI, mm. um, at least not with any confidence. So we don't know what we're building. Uh, we've never built it before and we're expecting people to be able to predict when 
uh, this kind of thing will happen. It's basically a task at which no one would demonstrate really any uh, significant skills. So that's why when I plotted all the experts' prediction, they were just all over the place because there's no reason to suspect they actually would have expertise. Well, I mean, a lot of experts' predictions isn't necessarily based purely on like expertise. It's motivated reasoning as well. Um, people are motivated to think in certain ways, like, you know, to make a prediction about heavenly AI coming to save them from doom or, you know, bef just before they die, for instance. Actually, that, that I found was wrong. Yeah, I know you uh, mentioned that. that. Hmm. And uh, we plotted basically life expectancy versus time to AI. And there was no real pattern there. It did not seem that people were predicting AI just before they died. Okay. Fair enough. So, um... The the strongest prediction was that people were tending to predict between 15 and 25 years in the future mm. from whenever they were. Okay. And my, my pet theory is that this is because it's very hard to predict something as possible, but taking more than say three technological cycles. Mm -hmm. So if you predict something is possible in 40 years, except if you're using Moore's law or something like that, you have to imagine sort of the developments on top of the develops on top of the developments on top of the developments that will reach it in 40 years, but not before. Yeah. So, yeah. So it makes it really difficult and imagining developments on top of the developments makes predictions less and less likely because there's so much, you know, chaos involved and it's just very hard to make these sorts of predictions with our limited skull bound minds. So let me ask you if, 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 if is there any, have you thought about any near-term developments in an AI that you think is likely? And also, um, yeah, yeah, let's start with that point. What do you think the, the near-term developments in AI will look like within the next five years, if that's not too far away? Um, I don't know. Um, I... Uh, this is the again the essential ambiguity of the term AI. Mm. Uh, does it refer to the human-like intelligence, or does it refer to advanced computing power? Well, advanced uh, computing power. I mean, how about let's just say uh, a general ability to to um, achieve goals, or um, you know, a wider uh, like a computer being able to do a wider variety of tasks. Uh, without, without, without brittle sort of programming, if you know what I mean. Narrow. I don't see general intelligence uh, arriving in the next five years um, with any high probability. Um, if neural net-based approaches continue to show the promise that they have, mm. though we are going to find... I mean, because we're starting to crack image recognition. We're starting to crack face recognition. We're starting to crack voice recognition. Um, I think robotics is a bit going to be a bit slower, but it'll probably get there after that as well. So we're basically going to be able to automate almost any process except for genuine general intelligence itself, and maybe some um, movement-based things, uh, which might still be slower than others. But even there, even for the job that I think is the safest from automation of all, i.e. the cleaner, um, even that job is not, might not be safe over 10, 15 years. Um, if, say, neural net-based approaches can be extended to robotics, they probably are. This is robotics is a field which I know little, so should probably not comment on. So let's forget about robotics. Okay, fair enough. Um, well, but what software, because would... the other thing to remember is you don't actually need to get human equivalent performance mm. before it becomes ec economical to replace the human. Mm. And this this is a topic which I've discussed a lot with James Hughes and and others. The whole uh, the the danger of um, moving into a, a, a social context in which humans have less less of an ability to to make money 
or to, to achieve some form of like a income unless it's guaranteed in some way uh, it may destabilize society in so in, in such a way that it you know there, there could be some dangers involved to society but of course you know I, I think the main point is what about all those people trying to pay off their mortgages <laughs> Right. and support their families and, and uh, you know, yeah, how, how are they going to survive? Well, th this comes down to predicting politics, which is even harder than predicting um, uh, many other things like technological developments. As Tetlock showed that basically expert political prediction exists only in a very, very limited field. So here, what, well, the the good the the, po the positive fact is that this means there's also going to be a lot more wealth available uh, because of this automation, mm -hmm. power, wealth, all that sort of stuff. So there's at least the potential for a good transition um, if you rearrange things. Um, the the difficult thing is that. Um, they're political parties that are wedded to the ideas that their ideas are true in some sort of universal sense. Mm. Um, when they might just be true in a contingent sense. Um, I, the obvious one to suggest here is that the, our idea of um, uh, capitalism plus large states um, idea is not is the great idea to have now, but not a good idea to have in these sort of AI automation scenarios, in which case, basically, people with perfectly sensible insights and correct ideas will suddenly find that all these insights and correct ideas are wrong, um, and um, will have to adjust or not adjust to that. I'm choosing that example there, though there might be destabilization in many different um, directions. Um, you, there's probably quite a lot of sacred cows that might get gored uh, mm -hmm. when the fundamentals of um, the economy change. Mm -hmm. um, and so just recognizing that, yeah, just recognizing that being sort of maybe not ideological, not necessarily ideologically flexible, but recognizing that some of the like, okay, let's critique the libertarians again, because it fits in the most with this thing, or, or not the libertarians, but the pseudo, say, pseudo Protestant idea that everyone should work hard and you, you get what you, the effort that you put in or stuff like that. Mm. And there's a degree to which it's true now, which everyone argues about, but it could be with enough automation that it's completely untrue. Suddenly human work is of no worth whatsoever. No one gets any worth from it. And the entire idea is broken. So this is a sort of moral idea of the worth of human that is broken by technological innovations. And then suddenly you have to adjust. And there, as I say, there might be others um, that, might, uh, that might get destroyed in various ways. I haven't, I tend to focus on the long term, so I haven't, not the long term, but sort of the extreme AI scenario. So I haven't thought too much about the low, mm -hmm. uh, though it, uh, AI scenarios. Now, there might, as I say, it might not end up in, there's a lot of sort of chat, chatter about sort of guaranteed incomes or things of the sort of social democratic um, direction. Mm. And I wouldn't like to conclude yet that that's inevitably going to be the proper way when sort of full-born automation comes. It might be, it might be that some people have extremely valuable skills or that humans uh, are sort of at a different ends of the spectrum mm. have extremely valuable skills that complement the AIs um, or the automations. Now, there's no real evidence that this would be the case, but we have to keep an eye out in case that scenario happens. And then we have to say, oh, yes, our ideas of minimum income or stuff like that. No, no, no. This is uh, not the thing we need to do now. It's all working wonderfully without that. Mm -hmm. As I say, I don't think it's likely, but we have to we have to always keep an eye on reality, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, well, do you think, I mean, I believe you do, but do you think the politics um, in which the first superintelligence um, begins to be built will affect the outcome of that superintelligence? 
it's possible, but the thing is, there are very few computer programmers who are also rulers of a country. Um, so the computer programmers are going to have much better understanding of what they're building than the people running that lab or institute or whatever. And they're going to have a much better idea than the people who are funding them or ordering them or something like that. So the politics are going to be important, but there might be sort of, if you want, two control problems. The first one is getting the AI to do what the programmers want it to do. And the second one is getting the programmers to want to do what the people are funding or the higher ups want to do. So, and th there might be AI arms races and there's issues there. And I mm. sort of have a paper on that, mm. but it's not quite as, as simple as bad politician orders AI to be developed and therefore bad AI is developed. Um, especially because there's no evidence so far that that kind of Manhattan Project approach or command economy approach will produce the the AI. It can work, can produce a lot of things, but sort of the creative AI thing is not mm. necessarily what it can make. Um, Let me ask you, if you had a private meeting with Obama <laughs> for 10 minutes, what would you say? Oh, yes. What would you say to Obama if you had a private minute, uh, meeting for 10 minutes? You don't have to um, rehearse. What, yeah. what sort of things would you bring up? About AI, of course. <laughs> um, well, um, okay, I'd make the quick thesis that Intelligence is what makes us so powerful, as he's basically the president of the most powerful nations on earth, and he didn't get there by wielding a sword. Um, he'll probably understand this concept. Intelligence might go with even greater power uh, in the future with an AI. So there's the first thing is that if we develop an AI, it might become very powerful, even just by copying itself and running itself faster. Then, um, I make the thesis that it is very hard to program human compatible um, ideas, um, sorry, motivations into an AI. And I'd probably get him to encourage to do a few suggestions as to what would be safe. And then the usual thing is people comes up with, uh, well, protect humanity or cu cu cure all diseases, which generally means kill everyone because that is the single best way of curing all diseases. Then they carry it, okay, well, keep everyone safe and happy. Well, then this is entombing everyone on heroin drips in concrete bunkers. And then we start to see how hard the concept of, say, happy or worthwhile or even alive, because our bodies could be alive without our minds necessarily do, uh, being there, how hard these concepts are, so that how hard direct programming is. And then I would sort of conclude with a badly programmed one that pushed itself to extremes would probably inevitably el uh, um, eliminate uh, humans if it became powerful enough to do it. Because just to choose another trivial example, there's a very big difference of how AIs would behave at different levels of power. Suppose you had an intelligent spam filter. If it's a low powered one, it would filter your spam. If it's a high powered one, it would shut down the internet. This, these two ways, these are two ways. Shutting down the internet is a better way of achieving its goal because then the spam is perfectly filtered because there's none. There's none whatsoever, but it can only do that at a high level of power. So there's a lot of goals that are actually completely safe for low level um, AIs that become very dangerous for uh, higher level ones. It's somewhat analogous to how if if you pick someone on earth and you made them a god, um, you probably wouldn't expect this to end up particularly well. But an AI is an even more alien mind than any human that's ever lived, or could, might be, uh, most likely be. So it would be even weirder, stranger, and probably much more dangerous than <clears throat> elevating a random human to godhood.
Mm-hmm. 